Well, hello, good afternoon. Uh, hello, VNUERD, Dr. Paul Morgan. So, hello, my name is Paul Morgan. I'm, I'm a consultant intensivist uh, based in uh, Cardiff at the University Hospital of Wales, most susceptibly to the Cardiff Vale University Local Health Board as well. So, so given the t title of this talk, is Sepsis the Silent Killer, because one of the problems with sepsis is unless you've been touched by it in some way, either professionally or you've had a family member affected by sepsis or you know a friend or somebody who's in some way been affected by this horrible illness, you may well not have heard of it. I mean, public awareness really has been very low. Although we've been working damn hard in the last uh, eight years or so to try and improve this picture. So a quick declaration of I'm also a lead volunteer for Wales and the UK Sepsis Trust. Okay, so this is, oh, I should say was, this is Chloe Christopher. Chloe's a 16-year-old girl who basically died unexpectedly on New Year's Eve at home. She felt unwell, didn't quite understand how unwell she was. Uh, families didn't, didn't appreciate how unwell she was. She, in the evening, said she felt awful, terrible, and before you know it, she's dead in bed. This is Jane Christopher. Now, Jane was a nurse working at the Royal Gwent Hospital as a nurse practitioner. So quite a senior sort of uh, role. She felt unwell one bank holiday weekend. Thought she was going down with possibly a bit of a chest infection. Uh, didn't really want to do too much about it because it was a bank holiday weekend, but began to feel more and more unwell as the weekend drifted on. She went to a local A&E department in, uh, in another hospital, not the one she worked in where she sat in the emergency department for several hours, deteriorating, this deterioration not recognised. Ended up with Jane surviving, but having suffered multiple amputations, so she's lost both legs, she's lost her left forearm, and she's lost the tips of the fingers of her right hand as well. So she's been profoundly affected by sepsis. This is Rachel Day. Rachel is a health, fit, healthy 29-year-old woman. Felt unwell pitched up at our local A&E department. It was quite busy, so uh, she said, I'm oh, not that unwell, I'll, I'll go home again, and uh, if, if it's no better in the morning, I'll come back. Only the problem is, by the time she did come back the next day, she was pretty much at death's door. She spent about 10 days or so in intensive care, had multiple amputations, including a large chunk of her face, as well as four limbs, and sadly died as a consequence of her illness. And this is Angela Burns. Angela's a sepsis survivor. Angela's an assembly member for uh, South Pembrokeshire. And she survived, and she's not got any physical disabilities, but she's been psychologically traumatised by her experience. Now, she'd never ended up in intensive care, but she very clearly describes the impact sepsis has had on her life, her mental abilities, you know, whereas before she could sit at her desk and concentrate on a, a job for, you know, two, three, four hours at a time, suddenly she finds she can do maybe 10, 15 minutes and then she has to sort of take a break because she just can't focus on the task in hand any longer. But what is sepsis? Now, as I, mean, I qualified in 1985, and we didn't actually have a sepsis definition at the time. It was one of those things that uh, you sort of knew what it was, but if you were asked to define it and you looked in the textbooks, you'd probably find lots of different things. So eventually somebody did come up with uh, a definition, and then I went through some fairly major revisions. So we had one in uh, the beginning of the 90s, then one in the beginning of the noughties. But more recently, in 2016, we published the third international consensus uh, definitions for sepsis. And this is actually a very good definition because it says what sepsis really is. It's a, dis a life-threatening organ dysfunction. So that's key things there are, it is life-threatening. We're talking about consist a condition of organ dysfunction. So your organs start to fail in diff to different degrees. And it's caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Okay. Now, infection is common. Okay. There are millions and millions and millions of infections every year across the UK, but most people don't die of infection. Most people recover. Maybe they get some treatment with some antibiotics or what have you, but generally speaking, you're going to recover. Only a small proportion are going to be bad enough to end up in hospital. Because, you know, GPs see these patients you know, day in and day out. Okay, but some end up in hospital and maybe you get some intravenous antibiotics and hopefully you get better. But then within that, we have the small subset who have this grossly 
abnormal response to infection where you start actually to attack your own organs and tissues. So as it says in later terms, sepsis is a life-threatening condition that arises when the body's response to infection injures its own tissues and organs. And that's when things start to go wrong. Your organs start to pack up and you end up with me in intensive care. And when, when, when you're in that situation, there's a worryingly high rate of death from that. Okay, and particularly think about the patients that we are often ones who have what we call septic shock, which is this subset in which these abnormalities are so profound as to substantially increase mortality. So we're talking sepsis, pure and simple sepsis, as a mortality rate of around about 10 percent. That's 10 percent. Okay, if you get septic shock, your chance of dying is probably approaching 40 percent. So it's a very significant illness. Now, of course. You know, what does that mean in terms of numbers? Well, you know, okay, you have not sepsis, you don't know what you don't know what it is unless you've been affected by it in some way. But most people will, you know, if they haven't had cancer themselves, they'll have a family member who's had cancer, they've had friends or relatives, they'll know somebody who's had cancer. So I always like to sort of compare numbers to cancer, but you know, that's easy. People know, have some idea what cancer is. Okay, now lung cancer is the biggest cancer killer in the UK. Okay, so as you can see, if between 2015 and 2017, on average, there were just over 35,000 deaths per year from lung cancer. Okay, amounting for 21% of all uh, cancer deaths. Okay, typically in the quite elderly patients. Okay, and it takes a while to come on. Okay, now sepsis, it kills people, and if it doesn't kill you, it leaves you badly maimed, as you've already seen. And we think there are at least 52,000 deaths each year across the UK, which even if that may be an underestimate, it could well be nearer to 80,000 deaths. So think about that just for a moment. Lung cancer is killing just over 35,000. Sepsis is killing 52,000 plus. Just let that sink in for a moment. Okay. To put it another way, if you totaled up the number of deaths from breast, bowel, prostate cancer, HIV and road traffic accidents, sepsis still kills more. Okay. Even if you do survive sepsis, which probably, you know, Still, you know, most people will. We're talking 10% for your sepsis and 40% for septic shock. So we've still got survivors. It's not a problem. But at least 20% of those who survive sepsis are left with what we might call, broadly speaking, this post-sepsis syndrome, which uh, comes with a number of physical problems. You know, it can be, you know, from the extremes, like, you know, like people like Jane who've been... Uh, gone through multiple amputations, but other people have had other sorts of uh, losses of tissue from de- having you know, necrotic tissue debrided, gangrenous uh, tissue removed, etc. You know, people find that they experience things like the hair falls out, their nails fall out, they don't grow properly, they, sk- they shed their skin. Bizarre symptoms, okay? And then with the psychological problems, you have post traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, you're at risk of further occurring infections, the risk of further episodes of sepsis. We know there's a very high rate of hospital readmission uh, within the first 12 months following an episode of sepsis, okay? So these problems can go on for, you know, months or years, or as I say, you know, unfortunately, people like Jane, this is, you know, and, you know this is a lifelong problem. So how can I spot sepsis? What is it, as a lay person, you might want to look out for that makes it make you concerned that you or one of your loved ones is suffering from sepsis? So we talk about this uh, condition where, you know, what, what sort of things, what sort of signs and symptoms could people be displayed that might make you worried enough to seek urgent medical help? So we talk about slurred speech or confusion. We talk about extreme shivering or muscle pain. Imagine you've got the flu, but then sort of multiply that, the worst flu and multiply, multiply that by 10, okay? You're not peeing, you're not passing any urine in a, in a day, okay? You're feeling short of breath, and you're feeling so short of breath that you're really struggling to catch it, even at rest, and you feel so awful that you feel you're going to die. There was an interesting um, report on uh, BBC Breakfast News a few years ago. On, we have a day on 13th September every year called World Sepsis Day. They interviewed uh, a GP from Manchester who was a, suffered sepsis herself, ended up in, in her local hospital. And she's described to the, um, to the interviewers how she asked the nursing staff to call her family and so that she could say goodbye to them. That is how bad she felt. Okay, just imagine feeling that terrified. Okay, and sometimes we see skins mottled and in discoloring, and that often be the sort of first uh, concern that this patient may be about to develop sort of, you know, gangrene. 
in children, obviously, you know, children, you know, present somewhat different. As you talk about, you know, very fast breathing, maybe they'll have what we call, a, you know, a fit or a convulsion. Sometimes some called febrile convulsions, which are generally fairly benign. If that's outside sort of the first year of life, that could be really worrying. Okay, they're looking mottled, they're blue, or they've gone pale, they've got a non-blanching rash. We always think about the sort of classic thing about meningitis. Okay, people, people who die from meningitis don't die from the infection itself, they die from sepsis. Okay, they die from septic shock. They feel very lethargic, they're difficult to wake. And they feel very abnormally cold to touch. You know, really that feels like something like a block of ice. Okay, how do we treat it? Okay. Well, in simplistic terms, one of the things we have to do as uh, healthcare professionals is to firstly recognise that a patient might be suffering from sepsis. So we're looking out for a number of key indicators, what we call red flags. Okay. So we, when a patient comes into the hospital, or even commonly known to their GP surgery, they'll have their observations taken, pulse rate, blood pressure, temperature, etc. And from that we can calculate something called the National Early Warning Score, which is in use across all of Wales. England are now finally catching up. So they have been a bit behind us, uh, but they now have news too, so that's another story altogether. And if they're, if they're scoring three points or more and it looks like it's due to infection, then we have to ask the question, could this be due to sepsis? And if so, you know, how, bad are, how bad things are with their observations? And if they're bad and have what we call red flags, then we have to deliver this bundle of care that we call the sepsis 6. So within that, it's fairly simple and straightforward. We give the patient oxygen if they require it to keep their oxygen saturation level above 94%. You probably seen in, on TV or if you've been in hospital, you're having this little peg sort of put in your finger and there's a little thing beep, 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 beep and it measures, comes up with a figure which is hopefully sort of 96, 97 for most people in the room, okay? But 94 is perfectly okay. At that point, if they're needing oxygen to maintain that oxygen level above that light, they need oxygen, okay? We then have to take blood cultures and this is probably one of the biggest failings in sepsis care to actually make a, a confirmed diagnosis. Take blood cultures. You take a blood sample and you put it into, a culture, into this culture medium and it sends off to the lab and uh, within a few hours or sometimes within 48 hours it'll ping up and say yes there's a positive result here and then they can test it for antibiotic sensitivity and we can change our treatment okay but we can't wait for those cultures to come back sepsis kills and it kills quickly okay so within this this sepsis 6 package has to be delivered within the first hour and the most important component of the things we give the patient is intravenous antibiotics now, we're not going to know what organism the patient's growing or what it's sensitive to, so we have to rely on our, what you would call, educated best guess. Okay, so we have information that's available to us through uh, our intern in the hospital computer system, but also, there's also an app on our smartphones called MicroGuide. And within that, we can look up, when we look at our, our local hospital, and it says, patient's got generalized sepsis, could be due to intra-abdominal or chest or whatever else, give this combination of antibiotics, and we go with that. Okay. We give them some intravenous fluids because they've often been ill for some time and they're dehydrated. So they might need to be given some fluid and sometimes that can help push the blood pressure up. And if it doesn't, okay, we accept that it doesn't and we go on to do it, treat it some other way with drugs to push blood pressure up. Okay. We measure a pro product of metabolism called lactate. Now, again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with your uh, biochemistry of glucose metabolism, but we have this, what we call this anaerobic pathway, which uh, starts off with a glucose molecule, ends up with a compound called pyruvate. Pyruvate builds up in the cells, and if it builds up too much because you've got not enough oxygen, or because you can't process it fast enough, which seems to be the case in sepsis, you divert it into lactate as a temporary buffer, and that lactate level goes up, and that tells you there's something really quite badly wrong with your patient. Okay? So you measure the lactate, and we track it to look to see how well our patient is responding to the treatment or not. Okay? I also measure the urine output because we know that the kidneys, they take 25% of the amount of blood your heart puts out with every heartbeat. So they're very sensitive to changes in your circulatory performance, shall we say. Uh, so if your kidneys aren't working terribly well because you've got sepsis, that is something which needs to be picked up and dealt with pretty quickly. Okay? So we've got this sim fairly simple package. We should be able to deliver it within one hour. Okay, um, people, can't, people have had um, t trials where they've delivered this in 10 minutes, so you know, it's, it's very feasible, okay? but half the battle is actually recognizing and realizing you need to do it in the first place. Okay? So after the third international definitions in July 2016, the National Institute for uh, Health and Care Excellence, they have to call it now, NICE, published NG51, which is NICE Guidance 51, which is all about sepsis, and they talked about screening our patients for what, what they categorized into low, moderate, and high-risk categories. 
And there's been some conversations batting forward, particularly with the UK Sepsis Trust. And as a result of this, just within the last two weeks, the Sepsis Trust have said, well, we probably need to tweak our sepsis section. What I've shown you to something very slightly different, there's not much in it. And uh, within that now, the, the Sepsis Trust and NISA, they'll say their tools are compatible and they'll, they've signed each other off, essentially. Okay. Now, of course, this is a new change. So we don't know what this is going to mean in terms of clinical practice just yet. I mean, this is, this is really hot off the press at the moment. Okay, thank you for listening. And uh, there's my email address, and I'm on Twitter if anybody wants to contact me. Thank you.